Acceleration is the rate at which, um, it's a definition question, so it's just velocity changes, and um, it's vector and vector. The strip of tape shows the distance moved by an accelerating trolley every 0, 0,2 seconds. So the change in velocity between interval 3 and 4 is, so I first have to get the velocity at each interval, and um, the velocity is equal to displacement, which is 0, 0,12 meters, divided by 0, 0,2 seconds for 3. And then you've got velocity for 4 is 0, 0,16, divided by 0, 0,2. Um, and so, and you've got 0, um, 0,6 over here and 0, 0,8 over here. So what is the change in velocity between those two? It's going to be 0, 0,2 meters per second. Montana enters a lift on the ground floor of a building, and then after traveling nonstop gets out on the 10th floor. Which one of the following graphs best shows the resultant force on Montana varies while she is in the lift? Well, as she get, starts going up, she's going to feel heavier. So she is going to have a resultant force on her that increases. Then she gets back to feeling completely normal, where there is no resultant force on her at all, so it decreases. Then as she is, um, the lift is coming to a slowdown, she feels lighter and then feels normal again. So you get those lurches and the lurches as the lift moves through those three different stages of the lift. So A is your correct answer. Patrick walks towards the back of a train at 2 meters per second and the train's moving forwards at 10 meters per second. So a person on the ground with respect to the ground would see him moving at 8 meters per second forwards. There wasn't a direction. Um, should have been I suppose relative to the ground but it just tells you a value. The next one, which of the following sketch graphs best represents the relationship between electric field strength and distance from a given charge? So electric field strength is equal to kq over d squared or r squared. So it is an inverse proportion. As the one gets bigger, the other one must get smaller and it must be a square relationship. So that leaves you with b over there. The next one is quite tricky. We've been given displacement and time, and we're asked to work out acceleration. And we do know that the object is free-falling from rest, so we can say S is equal to UT plus a half AT squared. And we can get rid of that term because we are starting off at rest. I'm going to, we can go over here first, and we can say 40 is equal to a half A, um, and the time there would be 2 squared. And I land up with A coming out to be equal to 80 divided by 4. And that's going to be 20 meters per second squared. So that is, that's that's definitely not Earth, okay? Um, and then if I go on to the next one um, over there. and So now if I substitute those values in, I'm going to get 40 is equal to a half A. My time is now 3 squared. And I land up with A is equal to 8,88, which is 9 meters per second squared, which doesn't seem unlike Earth, so there's a possibility that's right. Let's take a look at another one over here. Why don't we? We'll go with 30 is equal to a half A4 squared. So that is going to be equal to 60 divided by 16. And that comes out to be 3,75. So that's definitely not Earth. So the one that's most likely to represent free fall on planet Earth is going to be Q. So B is your correct answer. Tara Shea is out in space at a height twice the radius of the Earth above the Earth's surface. So the radius of the Earth is that, and she's another two times out, which means that in total she is 3R away from the center of the Earth. Her mass is 50 kilograms. What will her weight be in that position? Well, 50 kilograms, the weight normally on Earth, is um, equal to 50 times 9,8, so it would normally be 490. But I now need to divide that by 9, because it's 3 squared. Remember, it's going to be gm1m2 over r squared, and the distance has gone from being 
just r over here to being 3r, and therefore it's going to be 9r squared over here. So I need to divide 490 by 9, and that leaves me with 54,4 newtons. In the accompanying diagram, C is a current carrying conductor placed between magnetic poles A and B. The conductor experiences that force. Which one of the following combinations regarding the polarity of the magnets and the direction of conventional current is correct? So the first thing is that the conventional current either needs to be coming into the page or out of the page. We can't have it going in some sort of a clockwise direction or something like that. So we're going to only look at those two over there. Um, it does say it experiences a force, so we're in the motor effect. So you use your left hand and you are going to stick your thumb will go in the direction of this arrow over there. Your second finger, oh sorry, hang on, I've made a mistake here, over there. Um, your second finger, I'm going to start with going out the page, and then my, if it's, if I'm looking at B, then this would need to be north, and this would need to be south. Ah, that looks like a very good option, yay. Let's just discount the other one, um, which is, we are going to be going, I've really done a bad job of this, into the page, let's look at A, I'm going to put my thumb towards that direction. I'm going to take my second finger and put it into the page and I would find um, if my second finger is into the page and my thumb is that way, this would need to be south and this would need to be north. So the polarity of A is south, no that's not true. So B is my correct answer. For the LED emitting diode, on the diagram below, work to work correctly, it requires a potential difference of 2,5 volts. So 2,5 volts. Therefore, it's quite obvious, if I've got 4,5 there and 2,5 there, this resistor over here should have a reading of 2 volts. Um, what, and a current of 20 milliamps. What must the value of R be in ohms? So R is equal to V over I, 2 divided by 0,02 and I land up with an answer of 100 ohms. So that's fairly simple. The threshold frequency of zinc for the photoelectric effect in an ultraviolet is in the ultraviolet range. Which of the following will occur if X-rays are shone? Now, you are expected to know that it goes radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X, and then gamma rays. You are expected to have a vague understanding of the electromagnetic spectrum. And therefore, when I put X-rays on, it means that I am putting even more kinetic energy, more energy onto those particles. So the electrons will be released with more energy than they had when it was just ultraviolet, which was the threshold frequency. So um, C is your correct answer. Megan's playing with her yo-yo. She releases it from a height of 120 centimeters above the ground and reaches its maximum speed when it's 10 centimeters above the ground. What is the maximum speed? So V squared is equal to U squared plus 2AS. Zero is her starting speed. Acceleration, it's in free fall, 9,8. And the distance is the difference between 120 and 10 is 110 centimeters, which you have to convert into meters 1,1. And therefore, when I square root that, the velocity is going to be 4,64 meters per second down. The next one, the yo-yo bounces up, and it travels 100 centimeters before stopping. Calculate the velocity with which it bounced up. So we are going to say velocity, same equation, but different values now. At the end of its bounce, it stopped, zero. It started with a bounce velocity that we don't know. Gravitational acceleration is unchanged, and this time it only went 100 centimeters, so that's exactly one meter. And it turns out that this time it's bouncing in the opposite direction. So I land up with V being 4,43 meters per second squared up. Now it asks me to sketch an acceleration time graph for the motion 
for the ball in that whole time. Now, it's under gravitational acceleration for pretty much the whole thing. It says take down is positive, so I'm going to say 9,8 down is positive over there. And it stays that the whole time, except for a tiny little bit in the middle during the bounce. In the bounce, I'm going to have to have an opposite force, and there must be an acceleration in that opposite direction in order to turn the yo-yo around. And that is going to be your acceleration time graph. Karen is in a basket of a hot air balloon and it's stationary at a height of 10 meters above the ground. There it is. Here's his friend Chris is going to throw a ball. Sorry, there's 10 meters between Chris's hand and Harene's basket. Um, Chris intends throwing the ball upwards and Harene is in the basket and he needs to descend to catch the ball. Chris throws the ball up with a certain velocity and Harene starts his descent at the same instant that the ball was thrown upward by letting air escape from the balloon, causing it to accelerate downwards. Ignore the effects of air friction on the ball. Calculate the maximum height above Chris's hand reached by the ball. So this is a simple projectile motion. V squared is equal to U squared plus 2AS. And we're going to stop. We start with 13 meters per second plus 2. It's in free fall, 9,8 downwards. And um, the distance is therefore 8,62 meters. So this goes up by 8,62 meters, which basically means that this needs to come down by 1,38 meters so that they meet in the middle. Calculate the magnitude of the minimum acceleration of the ball in order to get there in that perfect time. So I am going to say distance is equal to ut plus a half at squared. I know the distance that I need to travel is 1,38 meters. And I know that I will start, or Haren rather, would start at zero. We know the time that all of this is going to take is going to be 1,3 seconds. Because they give me that information, plus a half, I don't know acceleration, and it's 1,3 squared. The acceleration, therefore, turns out to be 1,63 meters per second squared downwards. A plane requires a speed of 80 meters per second before it can take off. It accelerates uniformly from rest at the start of a runway for 10 seconds. The runway has a certain length. During the first four seconds after its takeoff, the plane covers a certain distance. Calculate the magnitude of the acceleration of the aeroplane for the first four seconds after takeoff. So, we're going to say... S is equal to ut plus a half at squared. I know that I have covered 640 meters in 4 seconds. And my initial velocity is going to be, I have to take off at 80 meters per second. So therefore, my acceleration turns out to be 40 meters per second squared. Then um, the next one is calculate the length of the runway that is not used during takeoff. So let's see what we've got. We have got S is equal to V plus U over 2 times T. The distance of the runway that they actually use is going to be equal to AT is the final velocity, 0 is the initial velocity, and the time that it was on the runway was 10 seconds. And therefore, you land up with 400 meters, which means that if the runway was 500 meters, 100 meters was not used. Now we've got the following velocity time graph for a baggage train that carries baggage to and from planes in the airport. The baggage train starts moving towards the right. What specific change took place in the baggage train's motion at point D? There were two important things over here. It stopped and changed direction. What is the total time, if any, during which the baggage train experienced zero resultant force? Zero resultant force means acceleration is zero, and that is between B and C. How long did that take? 20 seconds. Calculate the total distance covered by the baggage train in 40 seconds. So the whole time, we are going to calculate the area under that triangle plus the area of that rectangle plus the area of that triangle, and the question is distance. So it's plus the area of that triangle. And when I add them all up, so it's a half of 10 plus 10, it is 20 times 10, 
it is a half of 5 times 10 plus another half of 5 times 10 and that all together turns out to be 300 meters of distance. Calculate the baggage train's acceleration during the last 10 seconds of its motion. Acceleration is equal to the gradient of the graph and therefore we can simply say A is equal to gradient which is equal to minus 10 minus 10 minus 10 minus 10 change in y over change in x 40 minus 30 and I land up with minus 2 meters per second squared. The last one, which I promised you would be in the paper, but you just decided not to pay attention, please get these right. Placement in meters, time in seconds. And for the first part of the journey, we have got positive acceleration. So in displacement time, that comes as a curve. That's my first 10 seconds. Then I have got constant velocity on a displacement time graph. That is a straight line. 30 seconds. Then I need to slow down, slow down for another 5 seconds. And then I need to speed up again in the opposite direction. In other words, I need to come back on myself in terms of displacement, and that is 40 seconds. Um, the values for displacement were not required on the axis.